Hello, welcome, good afternoon. Uh, if you're just joining us, uh, hello. If you're just rejoining us, hello again. Um, uh, we have the great pleasure in introducing uh, Dr. Pete Wolfendale, who will present his talk, AI and the Artifice of the Self. Uh, Pete is an independent philosopher who has had affiliations with Newcastle University, Art EZ, uh, University of the Arts, and the University of Johannesburg. Um, this is, of course, following on from his doctoral studies at Warwick University. Um, I have to say that you should check out his website um, uh, because I very much enjoyed uh, reading the first page, first page or so, the introduction. I mean, I, I mean, it was full of information, but I enjoyed <laughs> reading it. I was like, oh, I'm going to come back to that. So, uh, I, well, yeah, just wanted to let you know that because I thought that was quite interesting. Um, and uh, it's actually great to uh, finally meet you, Pete, because uh, I was meant to meet you about this time last year because you were booked in for a for a session that me and some colleagues were doing. But then COVID-19. Um, yeah. Was on that. So, yeah. So great to finally meet you. Um, great to finally meet you, too. Uh, um, it's uh, it's really nice to be to be back giving a talk for the MPS. It's been many years, but um, <laughs> um, it's, I'm, I'm really glad to see all of the kind of uh, just organizational energy that's come into it since so um yeah um should i just go straight in or yes please yeah yeah uh, so okay yes allow please me, continue allow me to attempt to uh to get my my slides up uh just let's let's see how this works so okay um right uh Pardon me. Okay. Okay. Can everybody see this? Uh, yes, that's great. Yeah. Okay. So AI and the artifice of, of self. Um, I'm not completely sure how long this goes so I'm, I'm going to try and go through it as sort of reasonably quickly and efficiently as possible um, but hopefully you can see everything that I'm going through and if you know people feel confused by a particular point or there's, there's more they'd like to hear we can go back to that in questions um, so um, the the thing I'm going to try and do here so is to try and introduce you to my more abstract concerns in sort of philosophy of computer science by first trying to show why they're relevant um, politically. So we're going to start with a bit of political philosophy, work our way through into some more kind of abstract philosophy of computer science and philosophy of mind, um, which I think are basically the same thing. Um, and then we'll um, we'll come back and we'll see how these things um, are related to one another. Okay, to give you an overview of the talk, it has five parts, automatic politics, autonom autonomous culture, artificial intellects, unnatural desires, and cybernetic souls. Um, so let's begin with automatic politics. So the question to start with is where are we? Like what? What is the current political situation we're in? Um, because it's it's not completely clear. Um, there's a bunch of things we could focus on here, but what I'm going to focus on is the question of automation and what automation is doing to us um, as a society. Right. So the first thing we have to look at is increasing automation. Um, so there's, there's been several waves of automation throughout the history of capitalism, but the current wave of automation is um, unique because it's, it's characterized by the application of certain sort of forms of artificial intelligence to existing problems. Um, and this, this has several unique features. So I've got four that I'm going to discuss here. First of all, um, just sheer extent. Uh, there's a study out of Oxford University several years back that said 47% of current jobs are at risk of automation in the next 20 years. Um, so if you want to 
particular example of that call center work in the Northeast. Call center work is going to be one of the first things that gets progressively and aggressively automated. Um, but call center work, um, what, what distinguishes it from previous waves of automation, like say um, front level factory work, is that it's, it's a certain kind of service. Um, it, it, it deals with uh, so a certain kind of cognitive and effective labor. Um, and, you know, we're already seeing these kinds of services being automated elsewhere. So if you think of like kiosks and McDonald's, right, that's, that's one less person who needs to serve. Um, but it's not just sort of service workers whose jobs are being, um, are being endangered by this. It's professions that previously we would have thought of as being sort of forms of expertise that are outside of the possibility of automation. Um, so the most interesting here are legal and medical professions. Uh, and the reason for this is that um, when it comes to, say, diagnostics in medicine or just providing consultation in law, the actual data that you have to engage with, so like case law and uh, um, you know, diagnostic charts and things like this, are very well organized. They're, they're precisely the kinds of data set that are great for training up uh, machine learning systems on. Um, so we're gonna increasingly see um, sort of automated interfaces to law, and to uh, medicine. Um, now, the, the thing that enables these changes is specific developments in artificial intelligence that I'll talk about in a little bit more detail in a bit. Um, but the, the, the key development here are, are what, what are called deep neural networks, um, but other forms of machine learning systems. Um, these, are, these are systems that can so I'll, I'll explain this in a bit more detail but the key point is um that previous forms of of computer automation focused on um what you might call explicit forms of competence like tasks that can be broken down into explicit sets of rules um, that you can then tell a machine to follow whereas a lot of these new wave um forms of automation are based on systems that can learn implicit forms of competence. So for instance, being able to categorize breeds of dog on the basis of picture, right? That's something someone can be trained to do, but if you ask them, how do you, how do, you do it? They're not gonna be able to give you a complete set of rules for how they do it. Um, and I'll, again, I'll, I'll talk about that more in a bit. So, okay, that's increasing automation. That's how new wave AI is affecting, um, affecting society from the economic standpoint. Um, but the other side of this is, is not simply um, the ways in which we are bringing AI systems in to replace humans, but also the ways in which humans are being treated. Um, and I've put this into the heading of decreasing autonomy. So we're not just seeing increasing automation, we're seeing decreasing autonomy. Um, and the four things I've got here are uh, hyper-tailorism. So mechanical uh, so amazon warehouse workers are a classic example of this where um the you know every aspect of the job has been broken down um into its like minimal and most efficient form and they really know just what they need the human being to do which is not to think for themselves not to do uh anything which cuts corners or whatever but simply to follow the very very precise instructions that they're being given by the computer um and you see this in, in a variety of, of other fields. Uh, call centers are a good example of this too. Um, there's also uh, precaritization. Um, so um, a lot of jobs that previously would have been um, you know, career or contract work uh, are being um, turned into kind of, say, zero hours contracts or forms of involuntary self-employment where you find that you are your own boss now. Um, uh, but not because you want to be, because you're forced to be. Um, on the other side of things, um, there's also what you might call hyperemployment. So for those people who get to still have careers, increasingly uh, the, 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 the um, price of that 
is that the, the boundaries between work and life collapse. Um, and this is really obvious in the current state of things where um, constant connectivity, the need to be on a variety of different communication platforms all the time is, is ever, more, um, ever more obvious and, and invasive. Um, so to, to put the, the past two things in, in a different light, it's increasingly what you see is a kind of um, a, a, a polarization of the workforce between the core who get to have careers and the periphery who just get to have gigs. Um, and the, the, the fourth point here is, is fundamentally related to this, um, which is bureaucratization, which is a, a key part of the core. The people who still get to have careers are the people who administer the gigs. Um, <laughs> And this, I think, the, the the most interesting discussion of this in the past you know, decade is, is David Graeber's bullshit jobs, um, which is that they're, um, they're jobs that even the people who do them don't think should exist. Um, and there are lots of these jobs. And they're very much tied up with the sorts of um, perverse incentives that are created by the forms of administration that run... Um, basically every field in society and increasingly run them on the basis of precaritized work. Okay, so that's it. Increasing automation, decreasing autonomy. Um, here's another way of framing this, right? From the perspective of AI. Where we are right now is a strange moment in history where we are simultaneously creating fragments of minds. So these are the AI systems we're building. We're not building full minds, we're building these sort of like cognitive fragments. Um, and simultaneously, we are fragmenting ourselves into subpersonal cognitive components that can then be inserted into economic or political or social structures. Right. Um, so it, you don't just have to think about uh, Amazon workers. You can think about, you know, playing games on Facebook. Right. Things that draw you in to a, like a little dopamine loop right, in order to advertise to you. Right. That's that's Facebook trying to kind of isolate a certain kind of part of your cognitive structure and deal with it directly. So this is where we are. We are creating new fragments and fragmenting ourselves and then integrating them in a kind of ad hoc way. Um, so for me, the interesting question is, how do we integrate ourselves with these things properly? Um, but let's, let's, let's frame this question by going a little bit deeper into the history and just, just thinking about the, the tendencies that were involved in here. So um, where have we come from? Um, here are the, the sort of four basic tendencies, ideological tendencies um, leading to the present moment that we're at. On the one hand, we have humanism starting in the Renaissance in, in Europe. Um, this is a bit Western centric, but I think you can, you can make it a more general case if you want. Um, and the basic idea of humanism is that what distinguishes our species is our capacity for self-cultivation, right? So it is, it is, you know, we are the rational animal, it's rational self-cultivation, but it's crucially uh, the end of that rationality is self-cultivation. Um, um, modernism, which is the sort of self-conscious um, uh, sort of tendency coming out of modernity as a period, and, and the basic idea behind modernism is that what distinguishes our society, modern society, um, is the opportunities for self-cultivation it enables. So to put this in slightly different terms, you might see processes of modernization as um, being about gaining increased personal freedoms, or at least for some portion of, portion of the population, they get increased personal freedoms, but they don't get these from being isolated from one another, but rather from being connected in new ways. So for instance, the division of labor um, in the economy gives us all more products, right? Um, for 
you know, the same amount of labor as we had before, theoretically. Um, the the self-conscious political philosophy um, that kind of emerges out of this um, in the era of industrial capitalism is liberalism. And the basic idea behind liberalism is that what distinguishes our mode of government is the way it facilitates these opportunities for self-cultivation, which are very much conceived as economic freedoms. Um, you know, the freedoms to work, but also freedoms to purchase, freedoms of contract and things like this, um, um, by formalizing consensual interaction. So by like establishing the supposedly minimal legal and political institutions to enable these kinds of personal freedom that come from certain kinds of economic connectivity. Um, liberalism takes a variety of different forms. I'm just trying to get a rough through line here. Um, um, and finally, naturalism. And what I mean by naturalism here is not scientific naturalism, but normative naturalism. So the two things are inexorably bound up. Um, I say this because the natural or nature is the sort of key site of contestation in the history of liberalism, you know, going all the way from humanism through to political liberal liberalism and the, the articulation of the modern liberal state. Um, so liberalism is always kind of um, uh, um, flanked on either side by conservatism and radicalism. Conservatism generally being about pointing back to some, some past that must be retained or preserved uh, and radicalism pointing towards some future, or some better future that is implicit within the present, um, if only we seize it. Um, and in each case, um nature ends up being the 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 key um the key term especially in the enlightenment so um you know um it doesn't matter whether you're burke or pain burke will say basically well we have to stick to these forms of tradition because that's where divine right comes from right whereas pain will say no the natural rights of man right, invalidate every form of hereditary monarchy, right, um, and you can see this sort of dialectic of nature throughout the history of uh, sort of European political philosophy, leading into American political philosophy and so on. Um, the, the thing I want to point out here is that it, it's always important to think about what nature is opposed to, so not just the natural but the unnatural, and crucially, the two main ways in which the unnatural is, is thought is as either supernatural, right? So theologically, for instance, or as artificial, um, as technological. Um, and when I talk about the artifice of self, I'm I'm leaning into the artificial side of things, but we'll get there. Right. Um, finally, we've asked where are we? Um, where have we come from? And the big question is, where are we going? Um, so, you know, many people within academia will say, well, look, we're, we're, we need some kind of post-humanism, right? And there's a, a lot of disagreement about what this means. For some people, this means transhumanism, right? sort of technological self-cultivation, self-enhancement in ways that are, you know, unnatural, potentially. Right. Um, and on the other hand, you have people who who are sort of anti-humanist. And, and I don't mean necessarily sort of like aggressively wanting to destroy the human race or anything. But uh, but there is a kind of very notable tr tradition of sort of French anti-humanism that's very popular within certain parts of the humanities. Um, and, you know, some people, for instance, want to advocate for the rights of animals as equal with the rights of human beings. Uh, and this is this is presented as an anti-humanist gesture. And there are more forms than these two, you know, sort of uh, exemplary and perhaps caricatured strands, but, but that's a debate that's, that's going on. Um, what about modernism, post-modernism, right? Um, where, do we, where do we go after modernism? And this is equally um, contentious. Um, um, 
I'm, I'm not going to talk about the various ways you can interpret postmodernism. I'm just going to say that um, there are both forms of reactionary conservatism, right, that, that think that we need to kind of pull back, not just from liberalism, but from the modernism that it attempts to politically articulate. Um, uh, you know, sort of like reactionary monarchism, like it exists. Um, and there's also kind of like various forms of radical liberalism, which try and take this kind of legal formalism and, and push it further and as far as they can. Um, and I think that a lot of what we call postmodernism or post-structuralism in the humanities is often actually a kind of radical liberalism. Um, it's this, it ends up being this kind of uh, attempt to push a certain kind of liberal view to its hyperbolic conclusion. And this is clearly if you look at someone like Derrida, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to just throw that out there and not talk about it in too much depth. Um, finally, um, what are the actual sort of political economic changes uh, that we're going through leading to? How do we, how do we think about this? I've got two things I want to mention. Um, first of all, cognitive economics. Um, so now that we are breaking ourselves down into these cognitive mechanisms, um, we should recognize that um, it's not simply that as economic agents, we reason about how to use our resources to do various different acts. So like, what are we gonna, what are we gonna purchase with our, with our wages? Um, we also have what you might call cognitive resources. We have attention, for instance, right? We've only got so much attention to go around and we can only use that attention to make these decisions um, under very certain specific constraints, right? So, and, and this is not something that's external to economics. This is something internal to economics because economics deals with the disposition of resources. Um, when you think of Re economics in cognitive terms, um, you start seeing uh, the way in which capitalism has developed in the past few decades in slightly different terms. So the two things I want to point out here are what I call demand-side inefficiency and cognitive capture. So what I mean by demand-side inefficiency is that um, um, one way a supermarket can increase its profits is by increasing efficiency on the supply side. It can improve its logistics, right? In such a way that it can, it can sell you a product at the same price, but it's paying less to do so, right? So its profit margins increase. The other way it can increase profits is by making you make poor choices, right? If you make worse choices in the way in which you try and optimize your spending, right? They make money. Um, the interesting thing is that I think basically over the past couple of decades, what we've seen is this happen in basically every sector um, and it's synergistic. So like when everybody is trying to make you make worse decisions by sapping your attention, right? Um, they all work together. And so everyone is by default massively cognitively overloaded and stressed all the time. <laughs> um, and, and what this then does is to create a new kind of business model. And the new business model is what I call cognitive capture. It is um, basically you, you, you advertise to people that, look, we're going to take away your choice from you. you know, make one choice with us. Come, come and adopt our product or service. And you don't have to think anymore, right? We'll, we'll handle it for you. you know, and this is, this is very much how, how Amazon works. Um, you know, they, they want you to opt. They want to make your, your decisions opt out rather than opt in. Right, so you, you subscribe to something and it'll just keep happening. It'll just keep, keep coming along. I mean, you get this with like box meal services and a variety of other things. Um, even something like Uber, right? It's an app, it's straightforward. You, you say what you want and you get it, right? And you might pay a bit extra, but what you're paying for with that extra is not having to think about it. Uh, and what this leads to is um, what, you, what, I, what you call platform economics. Um, so you have these big platforms like Uber, you know, is, is an example, but like the bigger, the biggest platforms are like Amazon and Facebook and Google, Apple, you know, um, big tech companies like this. 
And essentially what they are is, is what I'd call sovereign quasi-markets. Um, their goal is not to compete in a market, but to become a market, right? You become a market within which um, transactions take place, and then you extract profit as essentially like taxation or time. Um, and because this is bound up with cognitive capture and cognitive economics, what it ends up being is a kind of cognitive monopoly, right? Like Apple or Facebook or Google want to be the sole site for you engaging in a bunch of transactions. Um, you know, they want to be, they want to capture you so they capture all of your business and all of the decisions that you're making, right? Um, yeah, um, slightly scary and it's gonna get scarier. Um, so that's, that's where we are. Uh, that's where we've come from and that's where we're going, automatic politics. Let's talk about autonomous culture. So if we, we recognize that um, through increasing automation and certain kinds of other political developments, we are becoming less autonomous. How do we preserve and maybe encourage our autonomy? How do we grow it? And can AI tell us about this? Can AI give us some tools for, for thinking about this problem? So first of all, we ask, what can AI tell us about ourselves? And I kind of mentioned it earlier on, I think that artificial intelligence basically just is um, philosophy of mind. Um, to be more specific, I think that what Kant calls transcendental psychology just already was artificial intelligence. Um, um, it's the project of trying to describe any possible mind, which isn't limited to human minds, but definitely does include our minds, right? Um, being a Kantian, um, I think that um, the, the key thing we need to understand is what you'd call normative autonomy. So this is what Kant would call self-legislation. To be an autonomous agent is to um, have authority over what things you're responsible for, right? No one can tell you what you're committed to other than you, right? And your commitments, you know, might, you might be wrong about what your commitments entail, right? You know, when you, when you, when you sign a contract, you might not completely understand all of the details, but you understand enough to consent, right? And, and it's, that notion of consent is underpinned by this question of normative authority or self-legislation. Um, what can AI tell us about building better selves? Um, what can it tell us about how to cultivate ourselves to be more autonomous agents? Well, I think the interesting question here is the question of what you'd call causal autonomy rather than normative autonomy. Um, which I've, I've here described as self-direction or authorship. Um, the other way to put this is to say um, self-causation, right? You want, you want your acts to be directed by your intentions rather than um, other causal influences in the world um, directing which choices you make, right? You know, I, I want you know, the, 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 the products I buy to be the ones that I decide to buy because of my own needs and desires, rather than because I've been marketed to aggressively in ways that have successfully tagged my unconscious and drawn me in a particular direction, right? That's a kind of causal independence, right? Not simply a matter of self-legislation. Um, to really clarify what's going on here, we, we, we need to more generally ask what freedom is. Um, pardon me. Uh, my watch is refusing to show me the time. Um, <laughs> so uh, here are the, the key three distinctions for understanding freedom, as far as I'm concerned. So there's a distinction between positive freedom and negative freedom. That's between freedom to and freedom from. 
liberalism is generally just concerned with negative freedom. Like lib lib liberalism is concerned with preserving your causal autonomy by um, ensuring that you are free from the influence of others or the, or the direct action of others upon you, right? But it doesn't say much about positive freedom, you know, you know what, it, what it is to, to actively be a free agent, what kinds of capacities one needs to be a free agent. This is where the second distinction really comes in. We can talk about the difference between quality and quantity in the case of free. So there's a difference between being a free agent at all versus being something that isn't free, just a mere causal system, and a difference and, and being uh, more or less free. And we can apply this to both the positive and the negative. So we can say, look, what positive capacities does one have to qualitatively speaking, be a, be a self-legislating free agent, right? But we could equally talk about um, quantitative um, capacities, like having more attention, for instance, right? Um, and we can similarly talk about quantitative negative freedoms. So we could say that you can be more or less free relative to those systems that are trying to impose um choices upon you right like you know if you if you successfully turn off all of the advertising that's coming at you every day and you create this lovely little filter bubble that's a way of potentially becoming more free um and this leads into the third distinction which is basically what i've already been talking about under the heading of cognitive economics which is that there's a difference between cognitive and non-cognitive freedoms there's a difference between the capacities we have to do things in the world you know to play guitar or write software or whatever, right? Um, I like to think I'm a decent cook. Um, and cognitive capacities, right? Those capacities that we have to make choices. Um, and so we can talk about negative, quantitative, cognitive freedoms. Um, and that's what I've been talking about in terms of this sort of like being free from um, the undue influence of, say, um, platform companies. Um, that's actually what Foucault is interested in. Um, okay, that's the question of freedom outlined. Um, let's get into actually talking about artificial intelligence. I apologize for, for doing this big political run, run up, but hopefully um, now that this is contextualized, what I'm going to say about artificial intelligence will make more sense. So the big question is, what even is in intelligence? What do we even mean by intelligence? Um, the standard way in which people um, in the discipline define it is as problem solving, the capacity to solve problems. Um, but how this is understood has changed over the history of the discipline. So we tend to talk about early AI as good old fashioned AI. Um, and Contemporary AI is very much dominated by what I was talking about under the heading of machine learning at the beginning. Um, in order to understand how this changes, it's good to introduce a bunch of um, distinctions um, in, in the understanding of problems and how they're solved. Um, so to begin with, uh, we might make a distinction between implicit and explicit competence. Um, I discussed this a little bit at the beginning, where there's this difference between tasks that can be broken down into explicit rules. So for instance, um, calculating the, the prime factors of a number. Now, this is very important in cryptography. There are algorithms for doing it, right? And you can talk about what the best algorithm for doing it is, at least the best that we've got so far, right? There are very precise ways of talking about things like that, and they can be automated. Whereas, how do you make an omelet, right? Uh, you know, I could give you some rules of thumb, but basically the way in which anyone, including a machine, is going to learn to do that task is by being trained rather than being given an explicit set of rules. Um, and, and, um, and, well, if anyone's interested in how that works, I can talk about deep neural networks during the questions maybe. Um, the other way to put this is, is, is to talk about the difference between 
symbolic and sub-symbolic AI. So um, classical or good old fashioned AI was very much concerned with, with symbolic approaches like automated reasoning. Whereas machine learning is generally favors um, sub-symbolic ones like neural networks. Like a neural network can kind of learn and contain a representation of things like say faces, right? But these representations are not, um, um, they're not linguistic in any recognizable way. Um, okay. Um, we then might talk about the difference between particular and general problem solving capacities. So good old fashioned AI started out with the idea of creating general problem solvers, like machines that you could just say for any given problem, like, oh, we want, we want you to do this and it'll come up with a solution, right? And this turned out to be incredibly hard and indeed impossible in the way that they, intended, they initially intended to do it. Um, they ran into something called the frame problem, um, which is basically that um, whenever you describe the world um, sufficiently precisely to enable this kind of reasoning, where you can go like, definitely, this is the way in which you do this thing. So say we've, we've described all of the factors involved in being in a kitchen and producing an omelet, right? Um, you know, then the idea is the system should just be able to reason out what a plan of action should be for realizing it. The problem is, is that these plans are incredibly fragile, right? Whenever you add something new to the, to the, this, this representation of how the world works, um, you have to specify how it changes and or doesn't change absolutely every other aspect. So the example I like to use is, you have to explain to your omelette making robot that when the weather changes outside, um, it won't change anything to do with the denaturing of, of proteins involved in the eggs, right? Like it doesn't matter how you change the temperature, the, 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 the weather isn't gonna vary in relation to it, right? Um, now, what this meant was that AI had to change and it had to essentially focus on solving particular problems. So AI became a field concerned with things like making Roombas. Like how do I get this robot to kind of maximally efficiently cover the surface of this carpet? Um, um, and the, the ambition of general problem solving kind of went away for a while. Um, what happened with the emergence of, of effective machine learning techniques um, is that we started being able to create systems that could learn to solve particular problems really, really well. And a way of putting this is to say that these systems were incredibly good at learning frames. They were very, very good at learning these completely integrated, like maximally self-connected representations of particular local contexts and the problems encoded in them. Um, however, these inevitably hit the same problem that um, good old fashioned AI hit in a certain sense, which is to say that when you train up a system to solve this very, very particular problem, you can't then get it to learn something slightly new. Right? You, can't, you can't get it to learn like additional features of the world that might enable it to, to, to change the scope of the problems it can solve, you've got to start from scratch, right? You've got to learn the whole thing all over again. And this is the, the kind of deep problem at the heart of contemporary artificial intelligence. And it's the problem of what, what we call AI versus AGI. So artificial intelligence versus artificial general intelligence. Right? How do we create systems that are general problem solvers without falling into this trap of good old fashioned AI. And the way I like to think about this is to actually say that this is the distinction between sentience and sapience. Um, so the, the cognitive fragments that we're creating, these systems that can do things like facial recognition, they're sentient, right? In the same way that animals are sentient, or at least in a similar way. Whereas what we're interested in is sapience, you know, what we have qua homo sapiens, 
right? And what is sapience? Sapience is wisdom, right? So the question is, what is wisdom? And if intelligence is problem solving, wisdom is problem reframing, right? With, to have wisdom is the ability to reframe um, one's understanding of the world in such a way that one understands the problem better and indeed can potentially solve different problems, right? Your understanding of the domains relative, relevant to one problem can become relevant to others. Um, let me give a very, very concise definition of this. I'd say this is about A, the capacity to learn. So it's about understanding knowledge as a process rather than knowledge as a product. Right? In creating wise systems, we're interested in systems that are developing knowledge in process rather than thinking of them as getting to a given specific end and going no further. Secondly, we can think about this as the craft of ignorance. Um, uh, so what I mean by this is, so I'm a big fan of Socrates and this idea that, that, that the love of wisdom begins with admitting what you don't know. Socrates begins, all that I know is that I know nothing except that's, that's actually something positive. Knowing what you don't know is, is a very significant part of learning, right? Um, because knowing what you don't know is being open to the ways in which finding new information might force you to reconsider what you already know. So the craft of ignorance is about understanding knowledge, not as this kind of um, just mere additive activity. Like we just we just get a new block of knowledge and we just add it to the stock, right? But these blocks are all isolated and separate. Rather, we see it as a matter of integration. Like new information has to be integrated into our existing picture. And this integration, because it might produce conflicts, information that we're getting might conflict with things we already think we know. Well, that means we've got to revise what we know. We've got to refactor knowledge right? That's wisdom, the ability to do that. And so here's my sort of simplest possible definition of general intelligence. General intelligence is the in-principle revisability of our integrated representation of the way the world is. So in some sense, any generally intelligent agent has an integrated representation of the way the world is. Right? We can say something more interesting about that later maybe but the key point is no aspect of this representation is beyond the possibility of revision everything in some sense could be revised right and that's what general intelligence consists of okay let's move from talking about general intelligence to talking about desire and unnatural desires so a lot of people in um, philosophy and related disciplines, when they talk about AGI, talk about it in terms of, of, of safety and risk. Um, so, you know, they, they want to ask the question, should we be afraid of, the, of AGI? And the, the inevitable answer is yes. Um, I, I think these fears are, are way overblown. And I think they're overblown um, because they don't understand how desire works or what it is. Uh, but let me let me go into these very briefly. So here are a couple of shallow fears. One is this this thought experiment of the paper clipper. So you, you get this super generally intelligent agent that's more intelligent than humans. And you say, we want you to make paper clips. And so it proceeds to convert the entirety of the earth and all the biomass of humanity and everything else into paper clips. Um, and, you know, ooh, horrible. We didn't, we didn't intend that, but, you know, we kind of got our, our monkey's poor wish. Um, uh, so the way I've described that here is that, you know, if you add automation to AGI, you just add like, a, right, do this particular task, what you get is some kind of monomania. Um, there's a worse case though. And this is, um, this is the Skynet case from Skynet from movie Terminator but there are, there are other examples of this. And this is basically the idea that if you create any AGI, by default, it will want to preserve itself. 
Like it will, it will, it will just automatically have some kind of survival instinct. And this means it will do everything in its power to preserve itself at our expense, which means, you know, it'll destroy us and we'll become extinct. Um, so one of these is a kind of an, an, an accidental issue. The other is a, is a, 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 a sort of case of deliberate malice. Like how do we stop ourselves from creating malicious gods? Um, allow me to, to draw out why I think this is stupid. Um, so what is desire? Um, let me, let me pose a, another thought experiment. Let's say we create an AGI and we give it the task to explore all of the possibilities of jazz. We say, look, look we want you to, to explore the limits of what jazz can be, right? What would it do? What would it even mean to do that, right? So let's ask the first question. Like, is this desire that we're trying to program into the thing determinate, right? Is it, is, is it, is it really clear precisely what it means to like jazz, right? Well, I like jazz, but I don't claim to know jazz especially well. Like the more I know about jazz, the more I know that I don't know. <laughs> it's it's a very very complicated, um, you know, research program. Um, so yeah, it seems like a lot of our desires are not completely determinate, right? Moreover, we might ask, are they transparent? Um, well. Do we, do we know what we want, right? Like we've got these drives inside us that are kind of pushing us to act in certain ways, but do we always know what they are and how they're gonna push us in, in ways? No, right? This is the sort of the, the, the key insight of psychoanalysis really is we don't know what we want. And that's a feature, not a bug, right? This is a constitutive feature of desire. Um, Thirdly, we might ask, are desires fixed? No, <laughs> like you talk to any human being and we've all changed and developed our tastes, if nothing else, right? Things that we previously liked, we, we don't quite rate as highly anymore or like at all. And things that we previously had no understanding of, like, you know, free jazz, that just seems to sound like noise, you get into it and suddenly, Oh my word, like this is this is the best thing ever. All right. Um, okay. um so we've got uh, uh, a situation in which actually when we look at desire, learning and revisability are actually sort of constitutive features of how it works for us. Why would we think anything different for artificial intelligences that we create? Final question, is survival our deepest desire? Like, do all of us simply want to survive at all costs? Maybe, and maybe we see that survival not as biological survival, like in the sense of my organism, maybe you think of it as the preservation of your genes or something like this. I think pretty obviously, no, right? Pretty obviously people sacrifice themselves for things they believe in. Like people prioritize things that they care about and their interests above um, mere biological survival. And I go one step further and say, the ability to do that is the condition of autonomy, right? If, if, if you weren't capable of doing that, you wouldn't be autonomous because you wouldn't be able to self-legislate, right? Self-legislation means the ability to set one's priorities in ways that conflict with egomaniacal self-survival. Okay. So what is autonomy then? How does this work? I think that the key mistake that's made by AI safety people is it begins with 
the very definition of intelligence is problem solving. Because what it does is to collapse theoretical and practical reason together, right? By providing an analysis of theoretical reason, AGI, general intelligence, they kind of automatically get a crude v view of the practical, you know, the monomaniacal or the, the, <laughs> the thing that leads to extinction from this. Um, and this is because they, they haven't properly separated out what's going on here, right? What they've, what they've done is created a sort of bad analogy whereby they think that any artificial intelligence that you create automatically has something like a self, right? In order to be absolutely bent on self-preservation. Self, um, but actually a self is something you have to construct. Um, a self isn't something that automatically appears with intelligence. It's an additional feature of intelligence. It's got to be added on. Um, so how do we understand what it would be to add it on? Um, I think the way to do this is to take our understanding of theoretical reason and dualize it. Um, what I mean by this is um, there's a there's a a duality between what you might call a theoretical reason as taking true, right? When we believe something, right, in the world, when we represent the world as being in a certain way, we take that representation as being a true or accurate picture of the way things are. But when we desire, right, or when we're committed to doing things, right, we take a representation of how we want the world to be and we try and make it true. These are sort of two different directions um, of, of, of flow in the relationship between an agent and the world. Um, and I think this, this, this quite initially simple duality turns out to be the way to characterize autonomy as the dual to general intelligence. So to, to give you my story here, when general intelligence is the ability to reframe problems, autonomy is the ability to choose problems, the ability to set which problems you yourself are concerned to solve. Um, and we might say that this involves the capacity to grow, right? Not merely knowledge, but now desire as a process rather than as a product. Right? Desire is something which it grows and develops. And similarly, we might talk about, rather than the craft of ignorance, the craft of interest, right? The ability to cultivate interests, not simply as these additional blocks that we just add on to our, we put on our shelf and they're all kind of isolated, but in fact, the ability to integrate our interests in ways that potentially force us to revise them. Because we can have conflicting priorities and when it turns out our priorities conflict we have to change them right so the the way the world is actually shaped the concrete impossibilities that structure the world um force desire to evolve in certain ways so to 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 put my statement of what autonomy is in as simple terms as possible Practical autonomy is the in-principle revisability of our integrated representation of the way the world should be. So what an autonomous um, artificial general intelligence would be, and indeed what we are, is in some sense a representation of the way the world is and a representation of the way the world should be, right? And each of these um, is internally completely revisable. There's no single belief that is above and beyond all the others. And there's no single desire that is above and beyond all the others. All right. That's what, that's what enables um, them both to grow in the correct, in, in the correct way. Um, okay. And this is where we get to the end. I, I think I've gone a little bit, a little bit over for what I was hoping, but, but hopefully this is all going fine. Um, cybernetic souls, what is it that makes autonomy possible, right? 
Well, my answer is the self is what makes autonomy possible. And it's a non-trivial design problem. This is, this is my complaint about AI safety is they think selves are just these things that just appear as soon as you create something that's generally intelligent. Like they think that, you know, give, give Alexa enough power and enough access to information and Alexa will just, you know, turn into Skynet and try and take over the world. But that's, that's ludicrous because Alexa doesn't have a self-representation, right? And the very least, you need some kind of self-representation. But can we say more about the design specifications here? Can we say more about what a self would have to be, right? Um, so here's my kind of first main claim. Um, autonomy is self-control, right? This is what combines the normative and causal dimension. Um, and but but I mean when I say self-control, I mean these in quite specific ways. So when I talk about a self, I think of the self as being a model. The self is a representation of us. I have a representation of myself in my brain. Um, but the best way to think about this is to say that actually what this is is a partition in our model of the world. You know, creatures with selves don't just have representations of the way the world is and the way it should be. They divide between themselves as one part of this world and everything else. Right. So that partition, at minimum, is what is needed to have something like a self. Um, secondly, when I talk about control, I mean, I, I mean control in a very literally cybernetic sense. Um, it's about kind of, uh, co you know, complex systems steering one another. Um, the way I interpret this is a kind of riff on Kant. Um, so I think that you can say that there's got to at least be two sides to this representation that constitutes the self. There's got to be a real side and an ideal side. There's got to be the way we are and the way we should be, right? And you can split this, if you want, into the body and the soul, right? The, the body is a means to the end of the soul, right? And what do I mean by that without making it sound too supernatural? Um, I think we are our own works of art. I think the what's what's inherent within humanism is this idea of self-cultivation um, of ourselves as an end in ourselves. This is where I'm a Kantian. What it is to be an autonomous agent is to be an end in yourself. And crucially, you get to define what that end is. Right. And there's a lot of the rest of you. Right. Which is simply a means to that end. Right. The soul is the work of art. The, the body is the platform that enables you to create that work of art, right? And precisely where you see the boundary between these two things is to some extent up to you, right? If embodiment is incredibly important to your self-image, then the body in the sort of sense of the physical flesh is ensouled, right? It's not, it's not irrelevant. It's relevant because you've decided it's relevant. But for some people, you know, particular bits of the flesh just don't matter that much. For some people, you know, they'd rather be cavity searched than have someone look through their laptop, right? Because that's where a lot of their mind is actually located. So this gets into the area of what gets called the extended mind in philosophy. Like, um, it, I just think that we, we get to, in some sense, define where our mind is and what it's extended and, and, and articulated. Not completely, there are constraints upon how we can define this, but you know, that's a deeper question and I'm gonna leave that one for now. Finally, uh, let's bring this back to the politics. Um, this is under the heading of authenticity and authentication. So a lot of people's response to this way in which our technological environment and its sort of economic enmeshment is undermining our autonomy is to double down on some notion of authenticity, is to say, ah, it's stopping us from being authentic selves. 
right? We need to get rid of all these screens and go back to uh, a more you know, traditional form of life. Um, um, I, I resist that. I resist that because I think that actually leads to the forms of reactionary conservatism we should avoid. Uh, I think instead we should think about authentication, which is to say, think about those processes through which we constitute ourselves, right? As selves, the ways in which we authenticate um, individuals as having access to certain things and how access to those things makes them the individuals that they are. Um, I could say more about this, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that a little bit normic. The specific thing I want to say is that there are already prosthetic selves. There are already prosthetic selfhood technologies that we are, but maybe not all of us, but a lot of us are using, right? Um, and some of these are what I'd call exo-selves, right? So Facebook, Facebook wants to be the thing that integrates you. Facebook wants to be the thing that's keeping track of who you are, what you want, what you believe, and to tie all of the other ways in which you engage in social contexts in those terms together. Right? That's an exo self. And people are worried about these, right? but they're, they're worried about them in the wrong terms. They're, they're worried about them in terms of data ownership. Like, oh, it's, it's bad that, that Facebook maybe has all this data about me. Right, I've got to assert my ownership of that data. Data ownership is the wrong way of looking at things. Right, it's not simply about ownership or property; it's about sovereignty. And this is the flip side of what I was saying about platforms as as sovereign quasi markets. Right, they, you know, Facebook as an organization is increasingly getting all this sovereignty. Well, we need some sovereignty of our own in in response to it. Right, and. And this is where I distinguish between a meta self and an exo self. A meta self is a, a, a tool of prosthetic selfhood that you control, right? And in fact, you're controlling it in some sense defines you <laughs> and thus that you control it, which is, you know, it's a, that's, that's a little bit philosophically twisty, but I'd stand by it. Um, I think where we need to go if we want to defend and enhance our autonomy to cultivate ourselves and to construct ourselves as better selves is to build meta self technologies rather than depending upon exo self technology, right? To, to have things that store our preferences and desires and organize our minds that aren't simply laid open for use and manipulation by those who want to direct our behavior, right? So here's my, my final conclusion. Um, to have a self is to be neither natural nor supernatural, but artificial. What I mean here is to say that the self is always artificial. Right? To, to be an end in oneself, to construct oneself as something that can potentially value things above its own life, right? That is already artifice, right? The thing that really distinguishes us um, as sapient, autonomous creatures is that we've already started constructing ourselves, right? We're not part of the natural order anymore. Um, as soon as we, we develop these self-conceptions, we are we are our own technology and that's it well thank you peter very good um uh, i've certainly got a few questions that's for sure but uh let's see if there's uh some here was i within time reasonable, reasonable? oh yes yes yeah yeah we've got yeah, some time yeah, yeah. Yeah, I sent you a quick message saying 30 minutes elapsed, but then I was like, you're probably, you're probably uh, straight in. Let me see. Right, well, um, I, um, I, let's go straight away if, if it's okay. I'd like to go to um, this, uh, the, the, the meta self as opposed to the yeah. exo self. So we can say that there's a kind of um, 
profit motive if we use the Facebook example? How can we get to a non-profit motive um, meta self? That's what I'd really like to do. I'd like, an, I like, uh, I don't know if anybody's ever played uh, Destiny or something. I'd love to have my Alexa floating around behind me, uh, manifesting things uh, as I, before I, in a, in a Facebook sense, before I realise I want it. That sounds great, but I really would rather it not be the way that it would have to be at the moment uh, yeah. through a capitalist mode. So how can we get there? So here's a very concrete example. Um, Amazon recommendations or, or Spotify recommendations, actually. You know, if a lot of us now use services that keep track of our preferences and use them to recommend things to us. Um, and you know what? Like, they're, they're very useful. Like, the, this is how they get you, right? The, you actually want this, these, these, these prosthetic tools of growing and developing your desires. Um, and to some extent, we, we have similar things with, with our beliefs too. Um, you know, like, you watch one documentary and they're like, oh, well, have you thought about this one? Um, the thing is, is that the price we pay for this is that they know what it is we want. And then they can sell us stuff on the basis of that and, and otherwise just model and predict our behavior. Really, there's, there's no reason why this should be server side. All of this stuff could be done client side, like, and it could all be cryptographically secure. Mm. So it, it could be that like, you know, you order whatever you like online, but it's, it's your software on your devices that is keeping the record of the patterns of, of, of choice so that it can then point things out to you like oh it turns out you, you just seem to really like 80s action movies you want to watch more of those like or you know to get back into the jazz like bebop seems to be the thing for you why not try out this All right um i i think we can and should develop services like this are we are we kind of waiting for someone to be super altruistic and write this software though? This is the question. How you know, I certainly can't write it. I don't think well, I don't imagine I could. I mean, I think there are I think there are people who do develop this sort. I mean, you know, if you go to the open source software movement, right? Like anybody in that crowd is very super skeptical of any tool that they haven't built themselves or that they can't look at the source code for. Mm -hmm. and, and you will find people building things like this you also find there are groups who try and build cooperative platforms um, there are political and economic problems there because it's very hard to out compete a platform once they've already got dominance because of network effects um, there are there are ways around this um, the main thing I'm trying to do is to sort of create the philosophical case so that people know that this is a, a problem for political philosophy and maybe political philosophers should be working with programmers, you know, and, and, and talking about how we build this stuff. I think to, to just say one final thing, like I'm a socialist, right? Um, a lot of people who work in these kinds of zones are more anarchists or libertarians. Hmm. And so like the original cypherpunk movement out of which movement, sort of movement, Bitcoin and stuff like that has emerged, that has emerged. Um, it, it um, is very individualistic. It is very individualistic. You, you build your own tools, build your own tools for, your own, for your own uh, information, uh, information sovereignty. Um, 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 I'd say, I'd say to, be, to be cypher socialists, um, we have to talk about coming together to build tools together. How do we how do we create resources for one another? And for people who can't write software, like, you know, people should be able to have data sovereignty who aren't software developers. Well, uh, certainly agree with you on that. Um, got a question here from Joshua. Um, uh, what would be involved in um, giving AI self-representation? Um, sorry, it's just moved. Uh, self-representation uh, to give uh, an AI a soul, so to speak. Mm -hmm. That's um, quite an emotive one. No, it's great. Um, I also, like, I've, I've been trying to get the, the term artificial souls to kind of trend just because I think that it it, it gets past this this problem of, of just talking about AGI as, as if they're these things that automatically have selves. They, they don't. So what, what would it be to create genuine artificial souls? So great. Um, 
what, what would we have to do? Um, so there's, there's a bunch of, of philosophical and technical difficulties here. I think, um, so there's something that, that is generally very well understood already in phenomenology and robotics. Uh, so this is, comes out of the Merleau-Ponty stuff. Um, is what he was talking about earlier, that there is such a thing as a body schema, right? So any, anything that is embodied needs some kind of representation of its body, like bodily position and integrity and a variety of other sort of information on the basis of which to plan action, right? And, and part of this is also separating between events that happen in the world and actions, things that you are responsible for. Like you, you can't be an agent unless you can distinguish between stuff that happens and stuff that you're doing, right? So you, we can talk about, about the body schema and how that plays an important role within embodied action. The problem is what we also need is something like a mind schema. Like you, you need to have a, a kind of high level, fairly simple representation of mental processes, right? In order to redirect um, what's going on. So this is very important for things like attention. You know, so like you're saying like attention is a finite resource. In computer science, that's processing cycles that you've only got so much time, right? And so much memory, right? To use for, uh, for performing certain tasks. And um, it is very easy to write software that will accidentally use too many resources. Like you get memory leaks and, and you know, all sorts of other things. Or you just get stuck on an infinite task that is never going to end. You get a, a an unproductive computation. Um, like a, a big part of having a mind schema is being able to identify when processes like this are going off the, off the rails and terminate them. <laughs> it's like, no, 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 no. Stop that line of thought. It's not going anywhere. Right. Uh, unlike, you know, and, um, I actually think that this is, um, I actually think this stuff is already implicit in Kant. So Kant says that reason is the faculty of the economy of principles. Um, what he means there is something like what I was saying about refactoring earlier, like reason has to refactor the understanding you know, compress it down and make it more usable. Um, but it also is quite literally cognitive resources. Like, you know, we all have limited abilities to cognize and part of, part of being a, a, a well-functioning rational agent, a wise rational agent is thinking smart, not hard. Um, using your resources well. Um, and, and, you know, I, I basically, I, I don't have a full answer here for what this looks like, but, you know, there's got to be a mind schema as well as a body schema. That's, that, that's those two things. We need those. Um, and on top of that, we then need the, the soul as the representation of, of what we take, well, how we should be. We need, we need not simply these schema schematic representations of how we are, but we need the ideal ego image, right? That's the kind of cherry on the cake. So yeah, that's my answer. Yes, very much. I would imagine that we would make poor candidates, a lot of us well, as a species to uh, just suddenly start making schemas from our own uh, decision-making process, because arguably we often get stuck at very, uh, odd places but we are good at unsticking ourselves and that's one of the key things that differentiates us from from most um computer programs as we currently see them um to be to be a little bit more less normic about this um what this is from a computational standpoint is exception handling like we're really good at exception handling um, and I'd argue that actually life is very good at concept exception handling, that basically what life is, is a bunch of exception handling mechanisms that just get more and more complicated until they develop functionality. So it's like the, so um, I might be going off, off on one here, but um, my, my dad used to program um, 
a code on mainframes and assembler, which is like very low level programming. And what he, he always said to me was, you know, 10% of code is functionality, 90% of, uh, of code is error correction. Um, and that's DNA, basically. Like DNA is, it's like a lot of error correction mechanism because whenever something mutates, uh, whenever there's a like, small variation, there's got to be something that handles that. Um, and um, so this, if, if, if you want to kind of um, say that, you know, com computing has to learn from biology, this is the lesson to learn from biology is exception handling is king. <laughs> Yes, I definitely agree with that. Uh, we have a question here. Uh, I'm curious what uh, what you would uh, think of mass manipulation techniques, uh, as in Facebook, uh, uh, things like that. What are your what are your views on that? Um, so I'm a I'm a Foucauldian on these points, uh, which means, like, as a Foucauldian, essentially, you don't have to believe there's a conspiracy to think that there's a power structure. Like obviously, you know, there are lots of people out there who are actively interested in like influencing our behavior directly, but mainly that they're, they're doing it to kind of meet quarterly report profits or something slightly more ambitious than that. You know, I, I, I don't think there are many people who are actively thinking, right, this is, you know, mass consumer mind control. Few people ever think in those terms doesn't mean that the systems they're putting in place won't realize things that they don't intend. Like, like politics is not just the art of the possible, it's the art of the unintended consequence. And as our capacities to, to act and change ourselves and manipulate ourselves grow, our ability to, to mess up um, grows, our ability to create these ridiculous unintended consequences becomes greater and I think what we've got at the moment is a sort of weird economic convergence upon a really bad model of um of cybernetic subjectivity like what we need is is to steer actively in the opposite direction towards autonomy and away from automation like automate the right things don't try and automate people Um, I have a question here. I'll try and condense it down. So um, there's this uh, the idea so the idea of consent or, uh, or autonomously opting into, say for example, Facebook's yeah. terms and conditions. But obviously, yeah. it's 17 miles long in April, yeah, yeah. Um, so not really a choice at all, is it really? Um, so uh, could you speak to that? Because there's a question here about the difficulty in finding your own data. If you want to get a copy of your own data, it's incredibly difficult. So um, can you speak to that? Well, I think this is a, a really good question, especially the way you framed it. So like we, we're all like constantly signing all of these contracts we're not reading. Like, that's, that's the default state of being on the internet and on, on any kind of, any sort of device these days. And I think um, this is what really um, demonstrates the sort of spiritual defunctness of neoliberalism as an explicit ideology. So it's like neoliberalism as an actual existing configuration and there's neoliberalism as the ideology. And the ideology is, if you look at Hayek, you know, and people like him is contract, right? The freedom of contract, that is the primary thing that the state needs to protect. Like we put all this stuff in space in, you know, we, we have legal and political institutions so that there can be consenting contracts. And that's what justifies everything that is done by the state um and you look at this stuff and you just go these aren't this is not this is this is this is not a healthy form of contractual obligation anymore right like and and, and crucially what it is is um is just what i was talking about under the heading of cognitive economics like you know apple have a, a football field filled with lawyers who are who are putting together these contracts and who understand, who've had all the training, who've got all of these resources, right, to weight the contract in their favor when you 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 have no nowhere no idea where to start. Um, like we are 
we are not all lawyers and we can't all traipse through that amount of, of text simply to, you know, play a game or, or use some basic service. Um, the, the real tension in the concept of autonomy, and this is something that Robert Brandom is very good on, is that in order for us to be able to commit ourselves to things, we have to have authority over which commitments we undertake, but we also can't have complete authority over the content of those commitments. So if I could, whenever we had an agreement, if I could just say, oh, well, I didn't mean that, I meant this. If, if I could always just say, oh, I am just redefining what I meant when I agreed, right? Then there is no such thing as a commitment at all. It's the, the Humpty Dumpty problem. Um, but on the opposite side, if I can commit to things that I have literally no understanding of whatsoever, right? You know, like you just get my hand and you stamp on a piece of paper and there it is, you own me for my entire life. You know, that that's obviously absurd as well. The question is how much um, understanding is required to engage in, in consensual agreement and contract. Um, and that's really, just, that's the question of institutions. And this is where you have to move from Kant to someone like Hegel. Um, you've got to start talking about how, how we end up with certain kinds of concrete mutual recognition. Um, so that when we perform actions, we understand basically what it is that we're doing and what the risks are. Um, uh, it's something I'd like to think about more, but um, that's, that's all I have for now. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, we'll probably just have one last question so we can have a, a, a break. So we've got a, a four minute, four minutes, four minutes are coming up. Right. Uh, and our, this one, this one's quite interesting. Uh, well, will AGIs be able to have loyalty? Um, I don't see why not. Like, well, again, well, again, again, uh, again uh, so I try and distinguish between automatons and autonomous agents. So like we can create AGIs that will be automatons and th there's no reason why we can't stipulate loyalty. Like I think it is possible just about more or less to, to, to instill in things direct priorities. But this is very much like saying you can raise children, you know, like in, a, in, a, in an environment in which they all become absolutely fanatically dedicated to a certain thing. Um, it's the same, same basic set of moral issues. Um, um, the, well, not necessarily because that suggests that I think creating automatons is always a bad thing I, I i don't i think it's perfectly legitimate for us to create things like super alexa you know like alexa but smarter than us in every way you know that's that that's fine there's nothing wrong with that um but but that 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 is something that has had has a built-in loyalty and it's a loyalty which is not a form of recognition right it's not like a kind of mutual recognition that you get where you're like, I, I know you, you know me, we both see each other as autonomous people, but I respect you enough that I'm loyal to you and your your commitments, right? You're, I'm letting you define my commitments to some extent, right? It, it's not the same, it's not quite the same thing. Um, but the the difference is subtle and, and something that is really worth thinking about. Like, so I'm, I don't want to, I don't want to end the question on a, well, yeah, we should be able to, because actually the question of how we do that is is very pressing and quite 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 tricky. Plenty to think about. Uh, so I'm um, sorry to everyone. There's loads of other questions. I'm sure we can probably pick them up um, at some point potentially. Uh, but yes, yeah, and they were really good questions. Long, in depth, difficult to read questions. So anybody who wants the, to uh, email email me. My email is very publicly available. You'll see my website. Email me. I'm happy to respond. Great. Uh, and, and thank you, Pete. Wonderful. Wonderful. Really got me thinking. <laughs>